Welcome everyone to the Coin Bureau podcast. His name? Mooch, Mad Mike Mooch. You, well done, you almost got it. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my name is Guy. That's a good start, isn't it? Okay. Um, do you remember m- m- Mike Mooch? Um, m- 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 do you remember uh, last time we were discussing the different types of cryptocurrencies out there? Yeah. And we talked about all the different uh, cryptocurrency coins. Different coins. Yeah. Mm. So uh, this week, we're going to do all the different types. Well, not all the different types, but the, some of the major categories of cryptocurrency token. Okay. Yeah. Because as you remember, a coin is something that lives on its own blockchain. So yep. Bitcoin or BTC or ETH, for example. And a token is uh, a cryptocurrency that lives on another blockchain. So, you know, Ethereum is a blockchain that hosts a lot of tokens, Yeah, for instance. So that's the layer one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so uh, there are now tokens, as, as I think we've discussed before, tokens are... There are so many of them, and this is and when Ethereum came along and made it possible to very easily create your own token on its platform. That's when sort of the crypto, the number of cryptocurrencies really began to explode, and now there are tens and tens of thousands of tokens. Mm. Most of them are worthless, um, and some of them, uh, well, some of them have, uh, some of them are are great. Some of them have uh, a lot of uses. Some of them are very valuable. And if you look through, if you look through the rankings on Coin Market Cap or Coin Gecko, some of the top cryptocurrencies are actually tokens. Yeah. So you can't, uh, you can't, you can't sniff. Yeah. You can't, not to be sniffed at. You can sniff them. You, you, I mean, you can <laughs> try really. sniffing them. Yeah. Probably best not to sniff at or or. <laughs> Just Don't sniff here. these tokens. Do not sniff these tokens. Yeah. So, um, and I think if the if the last episode that we did on cryptocurrency coins, if that episode didn't make it obvious, there is kind of a lot of the categories can tend to sort of bleed into each other. There's a lot of overlap in the different categories, and this is even more the case. Oh dear. With tokens, and if we were to cover sort of every you know, every conceivable category of token, then we'd be here for hours. So we're not going to do that. We're just yeah. going to look at some of the major categories. And I think probably um, a few people listening may disagree with some of my categorizations here. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's as I as I sort of sat down to put this episode together to sort of pull, you know, pull all the research together for it. It's it kind of dawned on me that I, you know, I'd sort of taken on a larger task than I'd anticipated, really, because there are so many different categories and there are lots of good arguments for lumping certain ones together in one category. There are some equally good arguments. Oh, no, this deserves its own separate category, et cetera, et cetera. So quite controversial categorization, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. One great one for the algorithm. <laughs> yeah. Now, before we go on, I just want to quickly talk about token standards because I'm going to use I'm going to use a, ter- a couple of terms that you may have heard before, but I just want to get the jargon out of the way so people aren't confused. So, sure. Ethereum has what are called token standards, and there are actually five in total, and they're referred to by um, by the letters ERC and then a number. ERC basically stands for Ethereum Request for Comments, and the most the we're only going to really talk about two uh, um, categories of Ethereum token today. We're going to talk about ERC-20 tokens, which are the most abundant. Most Ethereum tokens are ERC-20s. And that is the kind of standard uh, fungible token um, on Ethereum. And obviously by fungible, we mean each one is exactly the same. So one token is equal to another. So ERC-20 tokens. The other category is ERC-721, 721, however you want to say it. And this is the token standard for NFTs. Ah. And obviously NFT is non-fungible, so each one is unique. Unique. Um, the other one of the other ones is also ERC eleven fifty five. Oh yeah, and that oh yeah, that's a good that's a good token standard. Eleven fifty five. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, what time that... is it? Eleven fifty five. Just before midnight token. 
<laughs> um, and the ERC 1155 token <laughs> is, um, you have to say it like that, didn't you? Uh, it, that is a, basically a, a combination of an ERC 20 and an ERC 721. Oh, yeah, that's gonna when some two cool. tokens become one token. Yeah, it's 11, 1155 <laughs> token. <laughs> Uh, the other two, just out of interest, the other two uh, token standards on Ethereum are ERC triple seven. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, and ERC forty six twenty six. And I think I knew once upon a time what those are, and I don't just just going back to eleven fifty five. Eleven fifty five. So that's a mix of an NFT and a, and a and a fungible one. Did you say? Yeah, yeah. It has it has sort of qualities of both, and it's particularly you find it more in gaming when you kind of need oh, okay. you, you kind of want to have or something like that or... yeah yeah exactly when you want to have kind of a mixture of fungible and unique assets so there'll be a limited number of yeah of non fungible yeah yeah it's i think it you know it makes it, it makes it easier to to have uh, you know to have in game tokens if you need them to sort of fulfill several different roles to be sure. quite to be quite uh, versatile so those are the uh, yeah ERC twenty tokens. Um, if you know that's that that's the phrase that we'll hear most. Uh, we'll hear quite a lot. There's also uh, another popular um, another popular blockchain for issuing tokens is the Binance Smart Chain, or as it's now known, the BNB Smart Chain. And um, they have a similar one. Uh, it's um, called a BEP twenty. Uh, and that is a very common type of token. I've oh, it's gone out of my head what BEP stands for, so I'm going to have to look it up because I know you're going to ask me. Um, Binance uh, evolution proposal. There we are. A Binance evolution proposal. Now BEP twenty. Now this will these black will eyed become peas. <laughs> <laughs> or black eyed peas. Yeah, a black eyed peas to issued token. Um, this will become relevant. We'll talk about this towards the end when we talk about um, well. I'll I'll leave it till then. I'll leave it for Save a little the best surprise. For last. Yeah, because I don't want to. Um, uh, I don't want to preview it too much. Okay, so let's crack on with our first type of token, and that is exchange tokens. You might remember that last episode we actually talked about Binance Coin (BNB), which is the exchange coin of Binance. Now, BNB actually started life confusingly as a token on Ethereum and has since moved to the Binance chain to become its own coin. So um, there is, again, this kind of slight overlap here. But most exchange tokens are actually tokens, and most of them live on Ethereum. So basically, cryptocurrency exchanges, they issue their own native tokens. They issue their own native cryptocurrencies in the form of these tokens, and um, it basically function. They basically function as a sort of uh, native currency, if you like, for these particular exchanges. And some of these are pretty big. Uh, the Leo token, which is uh, Bitfinex's exchange token. You've also got uh, Kronos or Kronos. I never know how you say it. Which is Crypto.com's. Um, and you've also got FTT, which is the exchange token for FTX. And these all have multi-billion-dollar market caps. These are, you know, these are big cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of them, and I think for I think you could also include the tokens of um, sort of centralized borrowing and lending platforms, the likes of Nexo and Celsius. Celsius, obviously, a little controversial <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> but they also have these kind of native tokens and. They, uh, in the case of Nexo and Celsius, they, if you hold a certain amount of the particular token, if you hold a certain percentage of your portfolio in, in um, the particular token of the of the platform, then that can give you access to sort of special, like higher tiers of interest or better borrowing rates or something like that. It's kind, it's it's a little bit similar to, you know, kind of almost owning a share of the company. Uh. And this is where exchange tokens can get controversial because the Securities Exchange Commission, the Ooh. SEC, yeah, they, you know, they classify, you know, stocks, shares in a company. That is a security to them. And, um, yeah, they get they get quite het up about exchange tokens. So uh, exchange tokens, they are, well, I mean, I guess they're mainly really a kind of vehicle for raising money for the particular exchange um, because they're very easy to issue. 
and you know it's very easy to attract user capital with them. But you can, they do have their own uses on the exchange themselves. So you can use them to pay trading fees quite a lot of the time. Like for, you know, for any exchange, you will pay whenever you make a trade, whenever you... Does that not make it a security then? I'm not so sure it's... Because if it's more of a currency, really, or... Yeah, well, this is what the exchanges would argue. You know, they 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 would they want it to be viewed as a as a sort of native currency because mm. then it's not a security. Um, the SEC's argument is that it's like, well, you know, but you you are by owning one of these things, you are owning a share of that company of that particular exchange, and that, sir, is a security, mm. and you have to go to you have to pay a big old fine, or mm. go to jail, mm-hmm. or both. Um, the voice of the SEC there. So, yeah, these exchange like you can you're, you're always going to have to pay a trading fee on yeah. any exchange. And usually if you pay that trading fee in the native exchange token, then you'll get, you know, you'll get a lower rate. Some of them also give you kind of if you hold the token, you can you can sometimes uh, vote on governance proposals for well, the then, particular that, exchange. That, that, well, that's different then, isn't it? That does make it a share, doesn't it? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I suppose <laughs> you've got a certain amount of shares, and you can vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I think that's. I, I think the, the SEC uh, each sentence that sort of sways me. Oh well, then no. <laughs> oh then yeah. Oh then no. Are you are you basically playing the part of the SEC in this? No, I'm. Are you are you pitching for a job? No, no, at the no. SEC? <laughs> they'd be they'd be so foolish to, <laughs> to employ me. But it just kind of like it just it it just bears a lot of, a lot of resemblances. That, you know. Okay, cool. Also, we call them shares. <laughs> <laughs> our, our currency is called a share. Well, how many yeah, shares? I think they. I think they generally try to. I think they certainly try to steer clear of uh, of that particular uh, of that language. But mm. um, yeah, it can be. It, it's kind of murky waters. Yeah. Um, these, I mean, these exchange tokens, they're also, you know, again, going back to this idea of kind of raising capital for the exchange, you know, they're, they're good for providing liquidity for an exchange platform as well, you know, basically attracting money in, so, you know, that you could, that people can trade against. Um, and as I say, exchange tokens, they are something to be wary of, uh, to be wary of. Um, and also the exchanges themselves, they don't help by often doing, they often do buybacks of their tokens to maintain the token's value. And this is very, I mean, this is almost identical to share buybacks, which we see in mainstream <laughs> finance. And again, people like the SEC are like, well, that, I mean, that's a security. So they've done a, like a little pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> share, non-share this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so very few or not, certainly not all of these exchange tokens are listed on US exchanges as a result. I see. So it can be it can be quite difficult for holders in the U.S. to get hold of uh, to get hold of exchange tokens because the SEC, just, you know, is is so. Can you not just use a, like a a proxy and then? To, or is it, it's no your customer, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, all that sort yeah. Of stuff. They're 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 pretty strict, and, and I mean, it's some, not like Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> just access, log in with someone access else. Access sort of like Singapore <laughs> yeah. Netflix. Or yeah. Oh no, it's all right. I'm trading through my mum's account, <laughs> and she lives in Britain. That's fine. Um, yeah, and I mean, for instance, you might uh, anyone. Um, and anyone listening might be thinking, well, hang on, exchange tokens. Well, Coinbase doesn't have an exchange token. This is and American, isn't it? Yeah, and that's, that, that is one of the reasons why. Um, uh, yeah, I think Coinbase is just like, we just don't need this SEC hassle. And yeah. I think, you know, other, other U.S. exchanges, um, I mean, Kraken, I don't think there's a Kraken exchange token as far as I know. And again, this is to, this is to avoid the, um, uh, the, the, the problems with security status so exchange tokens i mean you quite often we do a kind of weekly rundown in our news section of of which particular coins or tokens have have sort of pumped the most over the past week and quite often exchange tokens figure so some people do get quite excited about them as a sort of speculative asset you i mean you have to be pretty careful because the their prices are subject to manipulation you know you do have these exchanges by deliberately buying back their tokens in order to manipulate the value so it's yeah if you if you are going to try and trade exchange tokens you need to proceed with caution there is quite a lot of manipulation that goes on uh, so they are you know they are fairly risky um, it is quite useful to hold a little bit of 
you know, if you're trading, let's say you're trading on Binance or um, or KuCoin or, or, or whatever it is, you know, it is quite useful to hold a little bit because you can, if it gives you access to lower trading fees, then that's, you know, that's cool. Yeah. That's great. But actually trading them, actually looking to make uh, money off exchange, to speculate on them is is risky. I don't, I've, I've never really bothered with that. Um Okay, so and I want to tell. We talked briefly about governance, and that brings me to a sort of one of these sort of subcategories, um, which is governance tokens. Um, and these, I feel, are a kind of offshoot of exchange tokens because, as I said, some exchange tokens do give you uh, governance rights, you know, voting rights for for the particular exchange. Um, Governance tokens are well, yeah, they, they're, they're not so much used for for trading fees or anything like that. Um, so these are aimed at giving holders a say in the governance of a protocol, usually a decentralized exchange mm. or a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and two examples that spring to mind: Uniswap, uh, which is uh, the biggest decentralized exchange. Uh, its Uni token um, is a good example, and then you've got MakerDAO, uh, its uh, Maker or MKR token. That's uh, those. Those are the two, two sort of best known examples. I think you can actually use them to pay for transaction fees, but they, they're you know, they're sort of more aimed at governance. You know, that's what the, that's what the protocols that issue them sort of talk them up as so again you can see this kind of overlap with, sort of yeah. gray area yeah okay let's move on then to the next category and that is stable coins mm. now this is one of these <laughs> this is one of these confusing ones. this is one of these ones where people sort of new to the space are like okay so those are coins right it's like no they're not they're stable coins are tokens um i don't think that no there's no stable coin that runs on its own blockchain uh, and this is, yeah, it's it's an annoying bit of terminology, but I guess stable token just didn't have the catch. same ring. To doesn't it. doesn't quite catch on. Now we've talked about stable coins before. These are cryptocurrency tokens pegged to the value of another asset, usually the U.S. dollar. The vast majority of stable coins are pegged to the U.S. dollar, or certainly the most valuable ones are. Certainly the the ones with the biggest market cap. Um, but other currencies are starting to be more widely represented. And actually, uh, Circle, which is a big uh, company in the U.S., which issues the USDC stablecoin, uh, has just um, is is now issuing a Euro stablecoin. Euro C is the ticker for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are, you know, there are a number of other stable coins pegged to other currencies, but they're not in. And do they run off the Ethereum? Uh, yes. I, yeah. Most pretty much most stable coins will run on Ethereum, but they do move to they, they are moving to other blockchains as well. Interestingly, USDC's official blockchain is Solana. Ah. Um, but the majority of USDC itself is on Ethereum. So, uh, and this is a thing, um, these layer one blockchains, you know, Ethereum, the Ethereum competitors, if you like, they are really trying to expand their stablecoin operations at the moment, because in a bear market like we're in, a lot of the, you know, the vast majority, actually, of the, uh, of the um, activity taking place is related to stablecoins, because obviously, these are assets that supposedly hold their value and are, and are much less volatile with some notable exceptions which we'll, <laughs> which we'll mention um so if you, if you many of the listeners won't be able to see this but your face just that was a <laughs> notable with some notable exceptions oh god yeah it's just the sort of the the, uh, the, the prospect is, of yeah. talking about ust again um but yeah as i said before Stable coins are a really important part of the whole crypto ecosystem. It's how most people trade in and out of cryptos. It's where most of the liquidity in the crypto market comes from. And as I say, lots of layer ones now are, you know, you, you will f you will eventually find, you know, most big stable coins on most layer one blockchains because, yeah, a layer one, I think, really needs to have needs to support stable coins to, you know, to survive. To, to stay relevant, there are uh, there are four types of stablecoin. There's fiat backed, there's crypto backed, algorithmic, and commodity backed. Okay, fiat backed are the most widespread and the most well known. USDT, USDC, BUSD, 
etc. Now, just a quick side note, though. Fiat yeah. doesn't necessarily mean cash. It doesn't necessarily mean dollars in a bank. Um, it also means debt of some kind. Okay. And in the case of the in the case of the biggest ones like USDC, for instance, USDC and uh, BUSD are largely backed by actual dollars, but a certain amount of US government debt as well. USDT, which is currently the biggest stablecoin by market cap, we, we're not really sure exactly what it's backed by. We think it's backed by some dollars in a bank account. But oh, not this is one many. they're being a very elusive about. Yeah, they, they've, they've, yet to, they've yet to do a full audit. So we, we can, we, we've yet to really know what the assets back in USDT are. Uh, the, the thought is that, OK, there might be a bit of US government debt in there. There's also almost certainly uh, some corporate debt as well. And corporate debt is a lot riskier than US government debt because you know, obviously companies, even big multinationals, are more likely to default on their debts than, than, than the US government. So those are fiat banked. Uh, you know, actual, actual, uh, actual currency and also debt. Um, then you've got uh, crypto backed, which is, I mean, you know, fairly, fairly self-explanatory. DAI uh, is the most, D-A-I is the most popular crypto backed stablecoin. Uh, UST was the most well-known algorithmic stable until that fell off its peg and went into a death spiral and loads of people lost loads of money. Um, you could see f uh, past episodes for what happened there. Um, there's now another one being issued uh, by um, Tron, which is another layer one, which is quite popular in uh, sort of more popular in Asia, I think, than than in the West. Uh, Tron um, has issued US double D, uh, which is currently not uh, is currently not on its peg. Currently, oh, God. Yeah, it's supposed to be worth a dollar. And it, last time I looked, it was worth about 97 cents, which I mean, isn't as bad as some, but you're still like, that's that's not a dollar. Um and then uh, you've also got uh, commodity-backed stablecoins as well. Pax G and Tether Gold, which is obviously issued by you know the same people who did do USDT. Uh, those are obviously pegged to the price of gold. gold. Yeah, I th I th I'm not sure if it's one troy ounce or yeah. Anyhow, um, stablecoins, as we discussed before, are also pretty controversial. Also in the sights of regulators, um, especially so in the wake of terror and UST's collapse. Uh, so there's almost certainly some sort of stablecoin regulation incoming in, you know, in the in the coming months or so. I would think coming months, certainly years. And uh, yeah, so sta stablecoins are a very big category of. So with the stablecoin regulation, yeah, who's going to regulate? Is that just the U.S. government? And the, then that kind of just gets defaulted across the world, or well, the U.S. government, I think, is is generally seen as you know as something of a trendsetter in that regard. Yeah. Um, so what? Yeah. What? The, where the U.S. goes, most of the rest of the world. Well, I say most of the rest of the world. Most of the rest of the Western world, if you like, yeah. will follow. Uh, the EU is currently. Um, uh, putting some stablecoin regulations through uh, various countries. Uh, here in the UK, before before our political system <laughs> collapsed into chaos, yes. uh, there was talk about um, there was talk about uh, stablecoin regulation too. And it's it's not all bad, you know. I think I, I think uh, uh, some some well thought out regulation for stablecoins could be a good thing. And what a lot of people are speculating is that the US government should really be very much in favour of stable coins because especially if they're it well, keeps the, dollar backed. The, yeah, 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 it keeps the dollar relevant. Yeah, it keeps the dollars. It, it, it's going to be much, you know, much easier for the dollar to maintain its status as the world's reserve currency if everyone is trading in these dollar backed stable coins because it drives demand for actual dollars and U.S. government debt, which is obviously, uh, you know, a net gain for Uncle Sam. Mm. So yes, stablecoin regulation coming. It's going to be it's going to be interesting to see. It's it's going to be, it's going to vary from from country to country. But uh, yeah, I think um, some sort of regulation is going to come sooner rather than later. So uh, let's talk about layer two tokens. This is an important little uh, important little category. The term layer two has become a popular one in crypto over the last year or so. We've discussed layer twos before. These are basically secondary platforms that exist to take some of the workload off a layer one blockchain to allow for more transactions to be processed. 
So sometimes known as off-chain solutions. Yeah. They work in, in various different ways, uh, but their kind of end game is the same. The majority of Layer 2s exist for Ethereum because... That's Ethereum, the most popular. Yeah, and it, God knows Ethereum needs them really because there is there is so much even now even in even in bear market times there's so much activity uh that you know any anything that can be taken off the main ethereum chain is is welcome uh, layer twos are not unique to ethereum and interestingly if you think about it the lightning network is essentially a layer two for, for bitcoin, bitcoin. yeah, yeah. It, it, it has a sort of similar function, um, although the Lightning Network doesn't have its own token because you know that would be that would drive Bitcoin as wild. You know, the Lightning <laughs> Network is all about you know transferring BTC anyway. You know, between people, so it doesn't it wouldn't make sense for it to have its own token anyway. Um, okay, there are there are lots of Ethereum Layer Two projects with their own tokens. Uh, more seem to be appearing. Um, the most popular one, the one that most people will have heard of, is Polygon, uh, which issues the Matic token. Um, and this is, you know, Polygon is a top 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 thirty crypto by market cap. It's it's a it's a big old project, and it was uh, it was in the news because uh, Polygon has managed to attract a lot of developers. A lot of projects that were building on Terra, obviously the now defunct Terra. So uh, Polygon has, has sort of thrown quite a lot of quite a lot of money at, at you know incentivizing developers to to move their projects over to its chain. Um, obviously, this money has sort of come largely from sales of yeah. the Matic token. Um, but yeah, so layer twos are you know are a, are a big are a big category. Uh, there's also the likes of Optimism that launched um, its op. OP token recently. Uh, Optimism works in a in a slightly different way to Polygon, but again the end game is the same. Um, and the tokens for Layer Twos are used mainly to pay the the much smaller transaction fees that Layer Two networks charge, which is hence why you know people want to use them. Um, they can also be staked to secure the network itself in in a lot of cases, and they uh, some of them have governance purposes as well. Cool. So those are layer two tokens. Um, yeah, a small but important category. Now this next category is is a wide one. Mm. is a very is a very big category, and I think it's one of these ones that you could end up pouring a whole load of different tokens into. And actually, I, I was talking about this with uh, one of my colleagues at uh, at Coin Bureau just the other day. So the, this is utility tokens, and what uh, what Dan, my colleague, said when I was talking with about it, you said, well, I mean, you could argue that, that all tokens have yeah, some all utility. Yeah, some sort of utility. Yeah, apart from meme coins and shit yeah. coins. Um, so it is, a, it is a very wide category. And some people, I think, would lump things like exchange tokens into the utility token mm. in uh, bracket. But I've chosen to separate them for this. And uh, Wild. If, if, yeah, I know. I know. Just Well, you know me, Mike. I just like to make crazy off-the-cuff um, decisions. decisions to like hell with the shirt. consequences <laughs> like this <laughs> right let's crack um, on what is it what are your reckless utility coin okay. uh, um, sort of so, generalizations yeah would, would... all right hold on to your hold on to your butts okay so um the official definition of a utility token is that it is sold to fund the development of a crypto project and then later on plays a role within that project's ecosystem Okay. Now, cast your mind back to when we were talking about Ethereum. Dentist and, coin or whatever. Well, then, yeah, yeah, that, that could, yeah, that, that, that could be something deemed to be a, a kind of wannabe utility token, yeah. even though it ended up, ended up being a uh, shit coin. Um, but a good example here uh, is, the, uh, is the basic attention token, BAT. Now, we talked about this when we talked about Ethereum in the ICO boom of 2017 because BAT is the native uh, token of the Brave browser. And Brave uh, conducted this, this ICO. This is the journalism one. Uh, this, is the de this is the decentralized web browser with kind of built-in privacy features. Oh, yeah. And stuff. And, and BAT is the kind of native token of that. So you can earn BAT for watching targeted ads and okay. things like that. And you can you can do things like tip creators. If you watch, you know, if you watch, if someone was watching one of your comedy videos on uh, on using the Brave browser, and they thought, ah, oh, that's that's funny. I mean, you know, on the off chance, <laughs> um, then they could, you know, they could send you a tip in bat. Yeah, you know, so it's maybe got bat 
baby got bat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually, you know, bat is one of these interesting projects. And, and when not to be confused with the Thai bat. Not to be confused with the Thai bat. No, there could be there could be issues if they issue a bat statement. Yeah. Coin. Just make sure you yeah, include that H. Um, it's you might remember that Brave actually it raised an enormous amount of money at this ICO and in something like 20 minutes. It was it was one of these insane ones. Mm. And I mean, I use the Brave browser. It's brilliant. I really, really like it. It seems to be getting a lot of adoption. Bat itself is, f you know, fairly volatile. Um, but it's kind of stuck around and I think it's, you know, I think it's a really good, really good project. Um, and I think, you know, I think it can certainly stick around in, you know, in, in the case of BAT, certainly the utility of that is fairly obvious. And obviously the sales of BAT very much funded the development of, you know, the further development of the browser of the whole project. Um, oh, I've made a note of it here. Um, $35 million in 24 seconds. <laughs> Not bad. Nice. <laughs> Pretty good. Another good example of a utility token is Chainlink's Link. And now Chainlink is an Oracle cryptocurrency. And Oracles basically provide data feed, data feeds for dApps to use. Okay. So let's say you have um well, I mean regular apps you know, get their data from kind of centralized sources known as APIs, application programming in interface. interfaces. Yeah. DAPs. I was guessing. <laughs> <to> application, <laughs> application, pit of bread, <laughs> integers. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was great. Um, DAPs get, to, uh, rather than get theirs um, from these centralized sources, DAPs, decentralized applications, get theirs from decentralized sources, which are known as oracles. And basically, oracles collate data from as many different sources as possible, and then they provide a kind of average figure as an answer. So if you were, if you were, you know, if you were, had a, a, a betting DAP, say, that offered, you know, that was offering betting on a particular race or something like that, then whichever oracle this DAP was using might might pull the pull the odds from all the kind of online bookmakers mm. and then you know give you an average. That's that's how that's how they work. So um uh, so an or average oracle. An average oracle, yeah. It's um uh, and then the oracle token, uh in the case of Chainlink, this link token is then used to pay for this data from these from these uh data providers. So, I mean, again, y you can probably see that there's a there's a definite utility mm. for that particular token. Now, Chainlink is the biggest and the best known Oracle crypto um, by quite a long way, actually. Uh, but there are others like Band Protocol and API3, um, which do you know kind of similar stuff, but in a, in in a slightly different way. Um, and actually, when I did a I did a video about the different types of cryptocurrency, I think it was last year. And the categories I used there were much wider. And I actually had Oracle cryptos in a category kind of all by themselves because it's it's a small but very important niche. Mm. You know, dApps really need these Oracle cryptos in order to uh, in order to function. Um, but uh, yeah, in this in this one, I thought I'm, I'm just because there aren't that many of them. I'm going to lump them in with utility tokens here. Um, now, there are a lot of other uh, utility tokens out there and, you know, which ones, which particular tokens qualify or don't for this niche are really up for debate. Now, some might argue uh, that things like GameFi and Metaverse tokens are utility tokens and others would argue that they deserve their own separate category. Well, I'm going to lump them in with utility <laughs> tokens because well, hey. because I you know I do what I want. Um, this I mean it is growing. The GameFi and metaverses, you know, that whole sector is growing so fast. I think it, it'll probably bust out into its own category before long. Um, but uh, GameFi and metaverse tokens are those designed to be used within blockchain gaming ecosystems or within metaverse worlds and things like that. So um, if you were to take a look at the charts, you know, the biggest cryptocurrencies, the ones that you, you, you might spot ApeCoin uh, and uh, Axie Infinity's AXS. They're the kind of largest GameFi tokens by market cap at the moment. Um, You've also got the Sandbox's a Sand token and Decentraland's Mana token. They are the top sort of metaverse tokens at the moment. ApeCoin actually, 
ApeCoin was issued fairly recently, and it's kind of straggling this, straddling this middle ground between a metaverse token, because apparently the, the Board Ape Yacht Club, uh, which issues it, is, is going to launch its own metaverse called Other Side. Um, and Ape will presumably use, be used to pay for things in that. But you can, you know, you can do other things in the in the Ape in the Board Ape ecosystem with uh, ApeCoin. Um, when you're talking about things like the Sandbox and Decentraland as well, like, it can get a bit confusing because Decentraland, for example, has two tokens. One is Mana, which is the kind of in-game currency, and the other is Land which is obviously plots of land mm. within the Decentraland metaverse. Now, these are issued as NFTs, as ERC-721. Tokens. Oh, so that's the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, it's the... Uh, at the moment, you know, the, these... They should uh, have done a 1155. An 1155. Makes, <laughs> makes both yeah. of them. Mm. Uh, yes, they may... Um, yeah, that, that, may, that may come in, in the future. Um, and tokens like these, they can be used to buy virtual land or they can be used as in-game currencies. They're mostly kind of speculative at the moment. You know, their success is very much... All, Down to you know, the, 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 the metro, metaverse. Yeah, yeah, the more people that use these metaverses, um, the more... Are they still... Because there was a lot of hype around them, wasn't it? Is, yeah. is the hype still there? It's kind of it's kind of died off. I mean, the, the, the tokens themselves, things like sand and mana, you know, for the sandbox and Decentraland, they are still they are still very big. They still have very large market caps. Um, but there was a massive amount of hype in them last year. Do you remember when uh, Facebook rebranded to Meta? Meta yeah. That basically lit a fire under the uh, under tokens like these, you know, under Metaverse tokens and also GameFi tokens. And the whole sector went really crazy and got and got really overheated and things like that. Um, so, yeah, that hype has that hype has dissipated quite a lot. But I mean, these projects are, are still going, and it's going to be really interesting to see which you know, a which blockchain games catch on. Because I mean, as I say, the biggest one at the moment is Axie Infinity. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No. You basically battle these sort of cartoon monsters, uh, and you breed them and there's you know it, it, it's sort of like virtual dragon fighting yeah but not quite as exciting <laughs> it's very sort of visually it's not all that stimulating I, I've kind of I, I, I fiddled around with it for a bit when I was researching a video on them and it was just like, do you know what this is? Uh, I, I can see what you're trying to do, but it's not really for me. Mm. But uh, Axie Infinity in particular is famous because um, there were people in the Philippines playing yeah, and actually earning living. money from it. Yeah. Um, and it also has another in-game uh, token called SLP, which is, I can't remember if it's Smooth or Special Love Potion or something like that, which you use for breeding these axes and stuff. It all gets so it all you, goes quite That deep. sounds quite dodgy. It does a little bit, doesn't it? But uh, not dodgy, not dodgy in a um, uh, in a legal sense. But uh, yeah, so it's the, the GameFi, the metaverse niche. You know, these tokens are definitely going to be one to watch because I think sooner or later a metaverse is going to come along. People are going to go crazy for it. Yeah, because if you and try it's out, become the 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 sort of the standard one that everyone uses. Yeah, because there's so many, isn't there? There are a lot, and. You know, sandbox is the one that's kind of decentralized, is it? Yeah, sandbox and decentraland are both. You know, yeah. they're both decentralized metaverse projects. But you know, you do have the likes. I mean, Meta obviously, uh, Microsoft as well has been making noises about you know having its own metaverse mm. and stuff like that. Now, these. I mean, the worry is that these are the ones that catch on because obviously Meta and Microsoft and all these others have vast amounts of money to throw at you know, creating these metaverses, making them visually engaging, making them places where people want to spend time. If you go into Decentraland, for example, I mean, you know, it's how, cool. How do you get that? Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can access it. You can access it via the, um, via the web, uh, via your browser. But, you know, you go and kind of mess around in there and stuff. It, it, the, you know, it's getting better, but it's not like, it, it's not visually amazing. Yeah. Um, so there is still, there's, there's still a lot of development for this, but, I mean, the argument is that we're all, <laughs> in the not too distant future, we're all going to be spending quite a lot of time in the metaverse in mm. some way, shape or form. And what we want is decentralized metaverses and ideally, you know, ones that you can easily move between. Mm. Because 
I think the worry is that if if, if a big corporation comes up with its own, they're going to wall it off, and yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. It's going to be like a walled garden, and it will be really cool. But you know, you won't be able to. They won't. They won't want you taking value out of that. Microsoft won't want you taking value out of its metaverse and going and spending it in Apple's metaverse, mm. Meta's metaverse, or you know, Walgreens metaverse, <laughs> whatever it's going to be. You know, um, so yeah, the hope is that we can you know that we can end up with if we are going to have this sort of massive online metaverse then you can easily move between them and stuff so it's a it's a category to to watch closely mm. okay um okay so that's uh that's kind of utility tokens and uh again like there there are tons and i think you can you can lump a lot into that bracket um, but uh, yeah, some of them are kind of like the, the the examples that I use, Bat and Link, are, are, are kind of very, you know pretty obvious the the utility for that. Some of the others are a little harder to spot, but um, there are two remaining categories of token that mm. I want to talk about today. Nufts. Nufts. Yes, good old Nufts. NFTs, non fungible tokens. We've covered these a number of times before. We talked about them a lot when we talked about Ethereum. Uh, for anyone who's forgotten or didn't listen to previous episodes, uh, an NFT, a non-fungible token, is a token which denotes ownership on a blockchain of the asset that the token itself represents. And this is, NFTs are one of the big breakout niches of of crypto over the last couple of years. They've gone really, really crazy. Um, and a lot of these, you know, cartoon cartoon monkeys and things like that, pictures of apes are, you know, they are NFTs. They have really sort of, uh, they've been the most visible mm. part of the NFT ecosystem. And they've attracted a lot of attention. They've att- attracted a lot of criticism because a lot of people are like, why are people paying so much money for a picture of a monkey? And yeah, it's uh, it's a. And one a could argue a, that the Mona Lisa is, is the picture of a monkey. Is a pi- we're all apes, aren't we? Well, it's yeah, just, we're all apes. Yeah, the, the Mona Lisa is just a particular particular type of monkey. Um, it's a it's a rabbit hole that goes that goes pretty deep. NFTs, and like I say, we we've discussed them before. But um, NFTs are issued on a lot of layer one blockchains. They originated on Ethereum. Do you remember it was the Crypto mm. Kitties? Uh, which were the first big <laughs> NFT project. And was it a depressed owls or something? Depressed owls? Is that what we were <laughs> was do? that the one we were going to do? Or depressed otters or something? Yeah. <laughs> something Angry like that. badgers or yes, something. That was it. Yeah. Depressed badgers. <laughs> I'm still working on it. It's coming along well. Um, and the uh, ERC721 token standard is the main NFT token standard on Ethereum. Um, but yeah, a bit like stable coins, other layer one blockchains are are issuing NFTs, creating their own you know NFT marketplaces and things like that. Again, because this is where a lot of the activity on these blockchains comes from: people buying, trading, storing these NFTs in whatever form they are. And it's obviously worth mentioning that NFTs aren't just about JPEGs; they aren't just about profile pics for your Twitter or things like that. You know, so many things can be issued as NFTs, and as we discussed last time, I think some of the most exciting prospects for that are things like ticketing. And yeah, we talked I, I, about this for your for I, your club. Didn't yeah. You? Now, because each NFT is a unique token, a non fungible token, you don't find them listed on the likes of Coin Market Cap. You don't see them in the rankings. You can find some NFT marketplace tokens, though. So. Um, uh, things like looks rare or rareable these are these are nft marketplaces and they have their own you know uh, native tokens which can be used to you know basically transact on the marketplace you could perhaps there's perhaps an argument they're almost like exchange tokens in mm. a way so that's nfts the last category i want to talk about is uh is is one again that we've covered before, but uh, worth worth looking over again. And this is meme coins, mm. and I put in brackets here shit coins as well. Now it's a little unfair to perhaps call all meme coins shit coins, but the the overlap is is but pretty pronounced. The Venn diagram. <laughs> the Venn diagram is very close together. Yeah, there's a big there's a big old bit in the middle. Now, okay, so meme coins in brackets shit coins. Um, they're tokens created with no real use case in mind most of the time. Some are just outright scams. Some are just, you know, money grabs. You know, they, they're they not claiming to do anything. They're just like, you know, buy, you know, they're bought, they're, they're, they're designed like the to be spent. <laughs> yes, yeah, Squid Game is a, is a great example. A meme coin created to, you know, take Off it. Off the back of a hype of a, of a, of a streaming channel's 
yeah. uh, TV show. Off the back of something that was really hot at the time. Yeah. And, you know, just to take advantage. And it suckered a lot of people in. And, um, yeah, they they found that they couldn't then, you, you know, even when their tokens had shot up in value, they couldn't actually withdraw them. Um, and, yeah, a lot of people lost a lot of money. Um there is most virtually all again this is, is one of these misnomers you, you know meme coins and shit coins suggest that they might be coins they're not they're tokens yeah um because it's so such a big effort to, to create a coin and and the sort of blockchain that goes with it that it'd be kind of pointless to do it for something with no yeah, purpose yeah and this is the thing that, i mean this puts me in mind of uh, there are there are lots of arguments in the crypto community and you get especially some sort of hardcore bitcoiners and things like that you know they dismiss everything that's not bitcoin as a scam and things like that and obviously you have to be you have to be wary of scams because there, this is crypto there are lots of scams out there but if you know if you're dismissing something that's that's a cryptocurrency coin that has its own <laughs> blockchain like okay it might be a very very sophisticated scam the but long I mean, game scam. A real old long game, yeah. I, 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 that kind of language, I think, is really unhelpful because if you, it's, it, you know, it's a bit boy who cried wolf, isn't it? If you just dismiss everything as a mm. scam that's not, you know, that's not the particular project you believe in, then, you know, you, you, the, actual, the actual scams are able to sort of, hide, you know, they kind of hide. You, you can't see the wood for the trees. Mm. So Uncle scam. Uncle scam. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's um, you it, it, spotting spotting shit coins, spotting what is probably a scam is is an important skill to have. Um, now, again, like the only well, the only meme coin that actually lives up to the name and is a coin is of course Dogecoin, which we discussed last time. <laughs> um, and there's also, I mean, uh, th- one of the other big projects is Shiba Inu. Which yeah. is a sort of Dogecoin ripoff, if you like. But a, yeah, it's it's a weird one because Shiba Inu is is definitely a meme coin. Mm. Lots of people would would dismiss it as a shit coin as well. But there is actually a lot of development going on with Shiba Inu. You know, they're developing their sort of whole kind of coin ecosystem, and they've they're sort of issuing other tokens as well that you know governance to. I think there's a governance token called Leash or something like this. <laughs> oh God, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's worth mentioning those because I don't think Dogecoin and, or Shiba Inu are actually scams. I don't think much of them. I certainly would never buy any of them. But you know, they're not nearly as bad as the majority of meme coins and shit coins out there. So spotting shit coins is really important for any crypto developers, uh, any uh, crypto investor, I should say. Sometimes and developer. And developer <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you'd think the developers would know. Um, sometimes it's pretty obvious. They often have some deeply silly name, often with some kind of reference to a dog in it. Mm. Or increasingly so, Elon Musk as well. He seems yeah. to have a lot of shitcoin names. Um, so Doge Elon or Elon Doge or you know, anything like that, be wary of. It's a red flag. Uh, if you're looking at a token, look at the profile of it on CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko. And red flags to look out for include things. Now look out and see if it's an ERC-20 token on Ethereum, because that, you know, that tells you straight away that it's a token and that it therefore hasn't been all that difficult to to, to, to spin up. That, yeah. And a lot of them are also BEP20 tokens on the BNB ah. smart chain. And it's, it's again, like I don't want to suggest that BNB smart chain exists only to issue shit coins, but a lot of them are issued on the, on the BNB smart chain. This is one of the most important things that you can tell anyone new to crypto. Like if a coin or token has a, you know, is worth fractions of a cent, it's extremely unlikely to go to even a dollar in yeah, most cases. That would be amazing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, like if Shiba Inu went to a dollar, there would be a lot of very, very rich people out Bros. there. Bros. <laughs> yeah, uh, there would be a lot of rich teenagers out there, I can tell you that. Um, but like, so what you invest is, it could, um, is, is, is gonna, it's, it's, you don't need it to get to a dollar for you to be a billionaire or millionaire or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah. It's yeah. Kind of like, just invest and see the growth of your investment, not of that coin. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not the price of the coin or token that's important. It's market cap. That, that is what decides 
how much it can grow by. And everyone thinks that, they're, you know, that everyone wants to discover the next Bitcoin because as we've seen, at one point, Bitcoin was worth, I mean, was worth nothing and was worth fractions of a penny and all that sort of stuff. But that was the originator. That was the originator. Or one and of the people, originators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people forget that, I mean, Bitcoin has a huge, mar- the biggest market cap now of all. So it's got much less room to grow. And... You know, it had a it has a fixed supply, twenty one million. If you look, it's very easy to see the 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 supplies of these um, you know the, uh, of these tokens. I mean, it's not uncommon for for a token to have a supply of one quadrillion, which is the next you know the next one up from trillion. So I don't know if that's a, a thousand trillion or a hundred trillion or something like that. So you know, if 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 it did get if the token price did get to a dollar. That would make it more valuable than the entire world, mm. you know. So it's it it's it's about it's about market cap, you know. That that shows you, you know, the the kind of the, the kind of room to grow. And people are so often lured into believing it's like, oh well, no, this is cheap. Or people often say to me, it's like, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to buy any any Bitcoin because it, it's too expensive. No, you don't buy like, a whole Bitcoin; just buy some. Yeah, stuff. yeah. It's it's not it's not the price point that that matters it's yeah. market cap that's what's important anyway. anyhow um another red flag to look out for is limited exchange support so quite often a shitcoin will only be available via a decentralized exchange like for instance pancake swap or something like that and that's the only place you'll be able to get it and that is you know because because uh, no one else wants to bother with it well yeah and you know any sort of mainstream exchange will you know they have to do due diligence although it's sometimes you do sometimes wonder how much due diligence they mm. do. But yeah, anyone can spin up a token and list it on PancakeSwap. It's a much more, you know, it's it's a much more daunting process to then get it listed on, you know, even some of the lower tier exchanges. But PancakeSwap, anyone can do it. So if it's only on PancakeSwap, that is, again, a red flag. And I think that was the case with Squid. Mm. You know, you could only get it via pancake swap. Um, one or two of these criteria that I've discussed, you know, one or two on their own, doesn't necessarily mean a shit coin it's it, they're definitely red flags but once you start ticking all those things <laughs> off you know, you're like i think you're yeah i stop wasting your time you've yeah. got a shit coin on your hands now i should say some people perhaps quite a lot of people actively trade shit coins and some of them make money doing so and you know you hear stories of teenagers who bought a whole load of some shit coin and it went up a thousand percent and they made a lot of money um as I've said before, you don't hear about the people who trade shit coins and lose. You only hear about the winners. Yeah. If you are going to do it, you know, it's it, it's pure speculation. It's just gambling. If you're trading something that you know to be a shit coin, you are you are gambling. And it's important to be aware of that. Now, before we round this episode off, shall we do one of our ever popular and amusing rundown of stupidly named shit coins? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> No, guy. I find See you it, next week. I find it t- tiresome, <laughs> tiresome, and frankly quite trite. Um, okay, so I was flicking through uh, CMC earlier, and I came across Woof Token, mm. Chiba Inu, Chiba, Chiba. So that's Chiba, but uh, spelt with a C. Chiba Inu, Mega Bitcoin. Oh, that is cool. I mean, that's got. Is be that cool. with the guy from Mega? Uh, Do you remember him? I don't remember the guy from Mega. Oh. I mean, I'm not ruling it out. Um, but I mean, you know, Bitcoin's great. So if it's mega Bitcoin, it Kim dot really com. Oh, Kim dot com. Yeah, I remember him. Um, I don't. Th- I'm pretty sure mega Bitcoin has nothing to do with Kim dot com. He's a character. Yeah, he really is. He really is. Um, Meta Doge Swap. That's another one. Rocky Inu. I mean, stop. You know. We're going to end up with so much egg on our faces you know, in the future, aren't we? When everyone is transacting in space dog, <laughs> space. space dog has become the world's reserve currency. They'll dig this episode up and be like, "Do you remember those two goons scoffing?" No, because I've just lumped in. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's like, "Slow down! I can't! No, I can't know these down fast these. enough." Come on, pancake swap. Um, Planet Enu, Punk Sheba, Punk Sheba. <laughs> Super Mega Hyper Doge. That's a cool name. No bull. Hey man, it's just no all bull. bear. <laughs> <laughs> damn token. Damn. Damn token. Damn token. Uh, Do you Lu- remember Damn Daniel? Dan- damn Daniel, where'd he get them shoes? 
it's a internet meme trope or something from from you're the, the early meme o's. Lord. Yeah, you're the damn token. Uh, yeah, noble damn token. Uh, Luna classic. Don't know how that got in there. Um, <laughs> Doge man, cockapoo, <laughs> cockapoo, and baby squid, squid game. Baby squid. Oh God, yeah. can you missed squid? Get baby squid game instead. Baby squid. squid. Da, da, da. <laughs> you've been you've been spending too much time with your psychopathic son. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and I, I don't know. Baby seems to be a popular sort of. Uh, is that from um, the rappers? L- little little squid coin, baby squid. <laughs> <laughs> I I honestly don't know, Mikey. Um. But uh, yeah. So it, if if it has a stupid name, yeah. Then you know. Uh, beware. Okay, let's round this up then. So, why does the classification? Why why have we spent two episodes classifying the various types of cryptocurrency? Why does why does classification matter? Well, I think it's easy to get a sort of a macro view of everything if you kind of know what certain coins and tokens yeah do. Absolutely, yeah. I think if you're if you're looking if, if you're evaluating a crypto project, you know, you need to be asking yourself what. What does this do? What's its what's its niche? What is the problem that it has been created to solve? And if you can if you can come up with a satisfactory answer to that question, then that project is worth is worth looking at in more detail. If you can't, then you know chances are I mean chances are it might be obvious anyway. It might be called super mega hyper doge. <laughs> Solving the problem of the lack of a of a shitcoin called Super Mega Hyper Doge, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, it, it's a good start. What is it? What is this? What is this cryptocurrency purporting to do? What's its What's its reason for being? Has it got an actual use case? And then you know, once you've categorized it, even if it's just a kind of rough category, you can then that then gives you an idea of the other coins and tokens in that category. Mm. So basically, it's competition. Is if there is a lot of competition, if there are already established, well-established and well-funded cryptocurrencies in that category, you know that could be. That's a question you, you know you have to you have to ask whether this one you know what's this one doing differently? How's yeah. this going to? Am I backing the right horse? Exactly, um, and yeah, is it a is it a token that could have been spun up in five minutes on Ethereum or the BNB smart chain or or whatever it is? So it's important questions to ask and you know, a good starting point for your research. You know, find out what it is, what category it falls into, what role it's going to play, how it's going to make the world a better place. And that, uh, that will help you, you know, evaluate it and um, maybe decide whether to invest in it or not. So there you are. All wise. Um, people, yeah, if people have uh, take issue with my classification of tokens. I'll give you guys a number and yeah. you can text him. <laughs> text him directly. DM me to let me know. Um, no, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I uh, some, some people may. 07. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Home address as well. Okay, it's number three. Um, so yeah, if you people might disagree. So if you want, you know, um, feel free to to comment or, or whatever. If you feel that there are other uh, categories that I've missed, or you know, categories that should be done differently, or you know, whether you think I'm just an idiot or or whatever it may be. Mm. Uh, next time, I've no idea what we're going to talk about. Is there anything you want to talk about in particular next time? Why don't we talk about the metaphor? We touched on it this this week. Yeah. And I think that's something that is, um, you know, it, it, it is interesting, and it, it, but it is also very daunting to sort of try and get your head around them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we could. Yeah. Talk about metaverses uh, and blockchain gaming in a bit more in a bit more detail. Yeah. And things like that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we might do that. We might do something <laughs> completely different. <laughs> And that, that it, do not take that as red. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll think of something for next time, um, and I will see you very soon. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Ta ta. Bye. <laughs>